Welcome to the Leadership Drop Podcast. In each episode, Pastor Jackie, along with selected guests from time to time, aim to drop some leadership insights that are designed to help you thrive, whether you're leading a church, a business, a team, a family, or simply yourself. So lean in, listen, laugh, and learn as we drop some leadership truth, and watch out for that leadership mic drop moment. Let's go. Welcome to this episode of the Leadership Drop Podcast. I want to talk to you today uh, about a subject called How to Avoid the Disease of Me. And it really delves into the teams that we lead. If you're a leader, you lead a team. You may lead a team at church. You may lead a team at your school. uh, You may lead a team of employees at your business. But it's really helpful to think about our leadership in the context of the teams that we lead. Now, I'm a sports fan. I love, this is such an awesome time of the year. Uh, I have my favorite teams. Uh, Many of you know I grew up in Oklahoma. Oklahoma didn't have any professional teams. And so I always say I was a free agent fan as a kid growing up. I could just pick anybody or any team I wanted to. It really didn't matter. Uh, I, I could pick whoever I wanted. We didn't have a team, a professional team at that time in our state. And so when it came to football, I picked the Dallas Cowboys, America's team, right? And so they're going to probably win the Super Bowl this year, and it's going to be great, and we're going to celebrate it. But it's been a few years. But back when I was a kid growing up, we had guys like Roger Staubach, and then later on uh, we went through you know the purgatory of Danny White and all of that, and so bad when your kicker is your quarterback. And uh, so that was kind of the Danny White era. And then we had Troy Aikman, and he came from Oklahoma, Henrietta, Oklahoma. So uh, I was a big Dallas Cowboy fan, Tom Landry, and then uh, uh, Jerry Jones, Jerry Johnson, excuse me, came and coached, won a couple of Super Bowls. And then the greatest coach of all time, Barry Switzer, the king, who coached at the University of Oklahoma, went to coach uh, the Dallas Cowboys and won a Super Bowl with them. So Dallas Cowboys was my football team. When it came to baseball, uh, the New York Yankees was my baseball team. I could pick any team I wanted. We didn't have a team in our state. I picked the New York Yankees. And it was funny because I had friends when I was growing up who picked teams like the Atlanta Braves and the Chicago Cubs. Now, you might think, well, that's a pretty good pick today. But back in the day, uh, the the Cubs were cellar dwellers. The Braves were terrible. Uh, I think they picked them because they could watch them. They, that was, they were broadcast. The Cubs were being broadcast, and the Braves were being broadcast on uh, their Turner Broadcasting uh, Network. Uh, but I chose the Yankees, and I have reasons for it. First of all, uh, we gave uh, the New York Yankees Mickey Mantle. Mickey Mantle came from a, a town near where I pastored later in life. So I helped actually dedicate the Mickey Mantle Baseball Field Museum. We had Bobby Richardson come speak at our church uh, the day after we uh, dedicated the Fields and Museum in Commerce, Oklahoma, if you're wondering where that's at. Uh, So we gave them Mickey Mantle. Also, Bobby Mercer. Interesting story. My dad uh, started in the All-State baseball game at shortstop because Bobby Mercer got drafted by the New York Yankees and was unable to play in that game. And so there's been ties all through the years. My dad's still a big New York Yankees fan. I think the greatest shortstop, really the greatest clutch baseball player in the history of the sport, Derek Jeter. I named my last dog Jeter. And so we love the Yankees. And when it comes to basketball, uh, NBA – I grew up a huge, huge Boston Celtics fan. Uh, I go back to John Havlicek, Nate Archibald. Those guys were so much fun to watch. And then, and then it got really serious. Larry Bird and that great rivalry between the, the Lakers and the Celtics, Magic Johnson and Larry Bird in the finals almost every year. Such a great time and season for the NBA. What made things really interesting – Uh, In our household, when I got married, and we got married young in life, is my wife and her family were exactly opposite than me and my family when it came to baseball and basketball. It pained me that my wife was a Los Angeles Dodger fan. Her 
dad had spent some time in the minor leagues with the Dodgers as a player, and uh, that my family was a New York Yankees fan. So we played almost back in those days, almost every year. It was the Dodgers and the Yankees and the World Series, and you know they had guys like uh, Steve Garvey and guys I just didn't like at all, Ron Say, and of course we had guys like you know Derek Jeter. So we were good. And so there was that rivalry all during in, in baseball in our house. And then in basketball, I don't understand how anybody could be a Los Angeles Lakers fan, but my wife and her family were. And so every year during the finals and basketball season, I'd be Larry Bird, she'd be Magic Johnson, I'd be Robert Parrish, she'd be Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and, and there was that conflict. So the teaching I'm about to share with you uh, about how to avoid the disease, the, the disease of me, it pains me deeply to tell you that it comes from Pat Riley, uh, the uh, head coach during the glory days of the Lakers and now the general manager for many years for the Miami Heat. But if you think about Pat Riley, he won championships both with the Lakers and with the Heat. He's been in leadership with the Heat every year. Maybe on a lesser budget, they put together very competitive teams. And the lessons I want to share with you and lift from his talk are from Pat Riley, the former head coach of the Lakers and now the general manager of the Heat. Here's what he says about teams. And we think about leaders. Remember how we started? Leaders lead t- lead teams. Uh, whether bad teams like the Cubs and the Braves back in the 80s and 90s or good teams like the Yankees. Leaders lead teams. And here, as a leader, here's what you've got to realize about there's a disease that can, that can infect your team if you're not careful. It's the disease of me. Here's what Pat says. First of all, there is a chronic feeling of underappreciation. If you see uh, symptoms of the disease of me, one of the symptoms of the disease of me is a chronic feeling of underappreciation from people on your team. It's nearly impossible to achieve anything worthwhile if you're consumed with who gets the credit. Uh, So if you're on a team and leading a team, you need to make peace with it now. Not everyone will be celebrated for everything they do. They're going to think they're going to be things that you go, that you do that go unnoticed by the leader. And there's going to be things that as the leader that you go unnoticed by the team that, that you do that go unnoticed by the team. And you're going to have to live with that. Uh, Find small wins and share in other successes. If you want to defeat the disease of me at this point, one of the things that I've found very healthy for me is just to celebrate the successes of other people around me. I mean, great job. Uh, I may not be hitting it out of the park, but you are right now, and I I celebrate it. A a second symptom, paranoia, paranoia over being Cheated out of one's rightful share. Riley says a second symptom of the disease of me is paranoia over being cheated out of one's rightful share. And so ask yourself this question. Are you consumed with increasing your personal brand over the team's success? Listen, that's not hard to see in the NBA. You see it all the time with players in the NBA. They are all about promoting their brand, their shoe deals, this and that, their socials. But they're, they're not as consumed with the success of the team. One of the things that is interesting about today in modern sport is how happy people can be on losing teams. Have you noticed that? How happy people, if they're getting paid, if they're getting their props, if they're getting their likes and their clicks and all of that, they can be happy to be on a losing team. I've never known great players that could be be truly happy on a losing team. Uh, If this is the focus of your life, being given your rightful share over the success of the team, little else will matter. You'll essentially have empty achievements on a poor team and fail to get recognized either way. That's that's how it works. So you can be a, a part and a cog in the wheel of the success of a really successful church, a really successful team, a really successful organization, or you could be the star on a horrible team 
And either way, you'll never get the recognition that you deserve or that you want. Another uh, symptom of the disease of me is a leadership vacuum resulting from the formation of cliques and rivalries within a team. Uh, Here's what happens. We create teams within the team. It it frequently leads to distrust, resentment, bad-mouthing, and animosity. Great teams in any field have one mission, one voice, and are abundantly clear about their larger purpose. I I heard a guy say in a conference recently, more than one vision always leads to division. I love that. More than one vision always leads to division. And so make sure you're not competing with the other vision or the primary vision of the leader. Here's a fourth symptom of the disease of me. Feelings of frustration even when the team performs successfully. Listen, success is never intended for an individual. It's for the whole. But one negative voice can really drain the excitement out of all other successes. So here's a key question I want to ask you. You need to be asking this question actually of yourself. How can I better fit with the specific group and what it is looking for? Anytime I go to a new organization to to lead, I get to be a part of a couple of different organizations, whether um, some national organizations, local organizations. I'm asking myself the question, how can I bring value? What can I do in this specific setting, which may be different from uh, the the other setting. I, I live in a setting where I am the I am the primary leader. I'm I'm the the head duck as uh, uh, as people used to say back in my home state. Uh, but I live in some other organizations where I'm far from the primary leader. I may be in the second, third, fourth, or fifth chair. And so anytime I go in those organizations, I want to ask myself this question. How can I fit and provide value for what this specific group or what this specific organization is looking for? The fifth symptom of the disease of me, personal effort mustered solely to outshine your teammates. (laughs) This is where the guy, the kid on the high school basketball team, he just wants to be the high point. No matter what, it doesn't matter if they lose. He wants to have the most points. Competition within a team is great, don't get me wrong, but only when it fuels everyone to reach a higher level. If effort is only put into up showing or one-upping someone else, it's essentially fake. It shouldn't be conditional, what I'm trying to say. So you need to look for ways to help the team level up, not just you or your individual stats level up. So how can I bring value again? That's the question. How can I bring value? How can I level up this team that I'm on so that it is a better team, a better organization, a better institution because I'm contributing to it? Here's the sixth symptom of the disease of me and will be done. Resentment of the competence of, of another. Someone starts rooting for a teammate to fail. You've seen it. I've seen it in high school sports. I've seen it in volleyball teams. I've seen it in basketball teams. I've seen it in parents in the stands where they're like, man, it'd be too bad if uh, Joe's boy, you know, didn't, didn't make that free throw. Or it'd be terrible if, if somebody twisted an ankle and my kid got to play. Uh, it is truly cancerous and it can take a team from the very top to the very bottom. And what you want is the, the guy on the very far end of the bench invested in the team's success as much as the guy that gets introduced first in the starting lineup. Does that make sense? So th- what is true on these sports teams is also true on teams that do business together. The guy at the very end of the hall, the guy in the, in the smallest office is cheering on and doing everything he can to make sure the guy in the corner office and the whole team is successful. We're leveling everything up. We're not pulling anyone down. If we are fixated on uh, being resentful of the competence of another, 
that mentality must be confronted and not allowed to fester. Here's a simple rule. Cheer for your teammates' success because think about this. If they're your teammates, if you, when they have success, it is your success. I played high school baseball. Uh, we had professional scouts at our games all the time because um, we had a really good team. And we had players on our team. We had a player on our team that played at the University of Texas with Roger Clemens, was won a national championship there. We had a couple of other players that played also at the University of Texas. Uh, my best friend in high school uh, was an all-Big 8 pitcher back in the days of the Big 8 before the Big 12 at the University of Oklahoma. He was drafted by the Cardinals, played for them and the Brewers. He was amazing. Um, and I played third base. And I like to tell everybody, every every third or fourth day when Scott pitched, I was the best fielding third baseman in the state because nobody could hit a ball down there. And I just went out there and I had a sandwich and uh, drank a Dr. Pepper and waited for my time to go in and strike out. Uh, but we always won. And so what I found, I, I could, it would have been very easy for me as a mediocre high school baseball player. I used to tell everybody in high school I was – I was small, but I was slow. <laughs> Not a good combination. But it would have been very easy for me as a mediocre baseball player uh, to become resentful and, and um, resenting the competence of my very best friend who the scouts were coming, and they were talking to him after the game. They didn't need to talk to me. But instead of that, man, I learned early on, Scott's success is my success. I have state championship medals in my uh, house till to still today that I would have never gotten had my best friend not been the best pitcher in the state of Oklahoma our senior and junior year. So here's the deal. When you are among teammates that maybe, maybe their competency level is higher than yours, that's okay. You know, the parable of the talents talks about you know, some are given this many talents, some this many, and some that many. It's not about how many talents you're given. It's just how you use what you've been given. And so whatever talents you have, use them. And if somebody has more, celebrate them. Can I say that again? Whatever talents you have, use them to make the team better. And if somebody on your team has more talents, celebrate them. Because the success of others on your team is your success as well. Hey, I hope you've enjoyed uh, this Leadership Drop podcast. Uh, we always look for those mic drop moments and hopefully you had one. And so, Sean, send it. you're given. It's just how you use what you've been given. And so whatever talents you have, use them. And if somebody has more, celebrate them. Can I say that again? Whatever talents you have, use them to make the team better. And if somebody on your team has more talents, celebrate them because the success of others on your team is your success as well.